Take your Bibles this morning. If you have them, turn to Isaiah chapter number 40. Isaiah chapter 40 this morning. Wonderful to see you all. Choir and musicians, thank you so much, Lee's Absolutely beautiful. Uh, the words, the message, everything about that song. Isaiah chapter 40 this morning. Did want to make a note today. Uh, many of you may have noticed this little flower down here at the front. This is in honor of a brand new addition to our Calvary family. Reed Michael Parker was born August 11th at 4.20 p.m., 6 pounds, 7 ounces, 19 inches. Parents Mason and Courtney Parker. And, and this is the Parker family of Don Juan's fame. Don Juan's fame and brand new grandbaby, and we're so excited. That kid is absolutely beautiful. His parents had him in church last week, like right, right out of the delivery room, he's in church, and uh, we're so happy for them. Give that family a big hand. Tell them how glad you are. We're happy for Reed. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40, if you checked your bulletin this morning, you saw that, that we have advertised a brand new series called Change Your Life for Good. And I've had some people ask me, there's an asterisk by for good. Yeah, that's intentional. Because I think so much of the time, this whole idea of changing our life, if you've been on earth any time at all, if you've lived through some hardship, if you've experienced some life, you know that so often the changes in our life are mostly cosmetic and awfully temporary. We feel like just about the time we've got the rat race kind of won, they put in a fresh rat. Just about the time we think, okay, this habit, this addiction, this problem, these finances, some issues with my marriage, some in issues with my child care, some issues in my walk with God, I feel like I've got a handle on this. It's going better. There's a better routine. Right about that time, it falls apart again. And so the Bible has so much to say about how to change your life for good how God really does that. And I always tell you, I, I think, I try to be as honest as I can. I try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. Um, and, and I don't want you to get the impression that, that that's so mystical that God kind of beams down a message to me on Saturday night, like, don't preach this, preach that. Oftentimes, it's far more providential. Sometimes what I'm studying the day before just goes dead on the page. It's just not where my heart is. It's not what I'm moved by. Very, very often, that's influenced by what people in our church are going through. Very often, there's this trend, there's this pattern of pain that rolls through our church like a wave. And I see person after person struggling with the same stuff or the same difficulties. And so this morning, I, I just I, this series is important to me. I'm excited about it. Um, I believe the content on this is so good and so solid and right out of the book of Romans. But I just want to press pause on that this morning. And I want to bring you a message out of Isaiah 40, 27. You, buy, you Sunday night Bible markers? Yeah, we, we addressed this text pretty recently in our Sunday night. I had so many people say, Pastor, that's a Sunday morning message. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a Sunday morning text. And I believe for where our church is this morning and where a lot of you are this morning, that was reaffirmed for me in our Sunday school hour. May God take this passage and just speak to you so clearly today. How many of you glad you came this morning? Say amen. All right, let's try that one more time. That was like 62% maybe. How many of you glad you came this morning? Say amen. amen. Isaiah 40, 27. Let's start with the text. God speaking. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, my judgment is passed over from my God? God says to his people, why are you saying God's forgotten about me? God must not be that interested in my life. God must not care what's going on. Verse 28, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, 
fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. God says, I'm not tired, I'm not exhausted, I'm not disinterested. I know exactly where you're at. 29. He gives power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. Here it is. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Praise God. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lord, I I feel this morning, I, I don't feel strong today, I feel weak today. I don't feel like there's a thing I can share in my own power that's going to do anything more than fill this atmosphere with, with my own ideas and thoughts. So God, I come in the best possible state today. I come needy. I come weak. I come realizing that if the living God doesn't meet with us, this is a waste of time. So Lord, I pray you'll take your word and apply it to some weary hearts and minds today. To some people that are right on the edge of giving up on their marriage or giving up on their kid or giving up on their job or giving up on their church or giving up on life. God, I pray today would be an infusion of strength from on high. Do what only you can do. Great God, get glory in this place. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I love our text. Uh, For many of you, I believe if we were to survey this congregation, many of you would say, Pastor, that's my verse. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. How often have we seen that up in people's homes? How often have we seen that demonstrated just across the thing? How How many times on Facebook does something come across the path and it's just that word you needed when you needed it? And Lord knows anything that comes across Facebook that encourages you is a good thing. Can I get an amen? It's a gorgeous, gorgeous text. Because it describes an individual that we relate to. Somebody who's weary. Faint. Exhausted. Mentally. Maybe physically. Just flat tired. And they don't know how they're going to go on another step. They don't know how they're going to face Monday morning. They don't know how they're going to continue on in this marriage and keep fighting for it when it seems hopeless. They don't know how they're going to go on with a child or grandchild when their heart is broken beyond repair and I don't know what to say and I don't know what to do and I don't know where to turn and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed but nothing seems like it's happening. I think we all have had that moment in life, especially if you've been on earth any time, where you have longed to spread your wings like an eagle and leave the problems of earth. Well, the atmosphere of that clear blue carefree sky. David, listen, this man after God's own heart. I'm so thankful, y'all. Listen, this idea of of stained glass saints who had attained perfection and didn't struggle with anything, that may have come out of some religious circles you're familiar with, but it didn't come out of this book. I'm telling you, you read about the saints in this book, they were pretty banged up. They had their issues. David, this man who committed adultery, this man who had another man killed, this man who could be headstrong and follow his passions too easily, this man who had a real hard time raising his kids and a harder time dealing with his grandkids, this guy was also called a man after God's own heart. And we have a, we have a hard time with that paradox, but God didn't. He knew David was messed up before he ever saved him. He knew you were messed up before he ever bought you. And in Psalm 55, David said this, My heart is sore pained within me. The terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me. Horror 
has overwhelmed me. And I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Oh, God, that I could get out of these circumstances, out of this illness, out of this tension, out of this debt. Oh, God, that you just let me free from it. You know what, some of you, that's exactly where you're at today. Some of you are crying right now. That's exactly what you feel this morning. So here's the question. This text is addressing in beautiful, vivid terms that individual and what God wants to do for them. And friend, listen, th this is where we get to one of those moments here. One of those moments where we have to ask the question, is this true? Is it just beautiful words and poetry and nice ideals and amazing literature? Or does this rubber meet the road of our real existence? Because God says, listen, He says this is more than poetry. This is more than nice thoughts. This is more than idealism. I'm telling you how life works. And I'm telling you, if you're flat busted this morning, God says, this is what I want to do for you. Our text has three elements. Shocking that there are three you've been here any time at all, you know I hate it when there's four and I can't abide two. Three feels just right. By the way, my microphone last week, I preached off that handheld and it, a bunch of you were like, that was weird seeing you walk around with a different kind of microphone. Yeah, for me too. And I, I basically asked the one who had stolen my microphone to give it back only to find it in my suit pocket last week. So I apologize. I'm sorry. I think my exact words were, if you're home like preaching sermons in the mirror with my mic, quit it and bring it back. So yeah, it's on me. It's on me. I found it. Our text this morning contains three elements, the problem, the promise, and the counsel. Here's the problem, exhaustion. Exhaust means to use up entirely, to empty completely by removing the contents of, to drain Verse 29 says it like this, he gives power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increased strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, the young men shall utterly fall. In other words, man in his strongest condition is not able to sustain his pace consistently, constantly in this race we call life. We often find ourselves in that place where we are weary or faint or fallen depleted, okay, when your batteries are totally uncharged and you're not getting them charged anywhere, right? Some of you feel like I'm constantly giving out, but I've got nothing putting in. I, I, I'm constantly doing for people and doing for work and doing for kids, and do, but, but there's nothing in my life that's working to fill me back up. God says, yes. Every person is going to find themselves at one time or another in that position. Verse 27, why sayest thou, O ja ja uh, excuse me, Jacob, and speakest thou, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, my judgment is passed over from my God? In other words, why is our first instinct to say, I guess God doesn't care about me? I've prayed, I'm tired, I'm weary, I've asked him to change my circumstances, I've asked him to fix my finances, I've asked him to fix my mate, I've asked him to do something about this, and he won't. So he must not care. God says, listen, that's the wrong conclusion to reach. I wonder if there's somebody here today, and listen, you are exhausted by unending responsibilities. I talked a little bit about this last week. Some of you, you feel like you are on that hamster wheel. How many of you, when you were young, had hamsters for your kids? Did you have those things? Yeah, at night, hamsters are just getting going when you're going to bed, right? And that squeaky hamster wheel. We had more than once where we'd have that habit trail, and back in the day, you could buy all these different tubes, and we had like a colony for these hamsters. They had a palace for them. They would escape 
the Fort Knox of like hamster cages. They would always get out and wake you up in the middle of the night like chewing on magazines in the middle of the corner, which will scare the fool out of you, by the way, in the evening. But, but these hamsters that we own, these little, these little pets um, that we had on that wheel, you know, they're not getting anywhere, but they sure are running. There's a lot of energy being expended. They're just not making any progress. And that's how some of you feel this morning. Some of you are like, I, I, some of you are like, I spend more time behind the wheel of my car more time caught in thir- on I-30, more time driving to and from work, more time driving my kids to soccer and to this and to that and to drama and to school and to stuff. More to- I-, I don't have time to breathe. I'm worn out and I don't know where to climb off this ride. Some of you, it is unrelenting difficulty, social difficulties, domestic difficulties, financial difficulties. And listen, no matter where you turn, no matter what you do, every day seems to hold some brand new terrible surprise. Some of you, listen, we got a bunch of them in this shape today, have unrelieved illness. Some of you know what it is to be in pain physically every single day day. We got people in hospitals and nursing homes across the Metroplex right now that every single day is just a fight to feel good enough to even function. Some of you, it's unprofitable labor. You've reached the point like this career, where am I going? What am I doing? Is this really what I'm going to do with the rest of my Life, I'm telling you, somewhere around 40, you start asking those questions. Is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? And you're tired. You're weary. You don't know if you can go on like this. And maybe you're asking, where is God in all this? Has he passed me over? Here's a second thought. The problem, exhaustion. The promise is strength. Verse 28, look at this. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the, notice the words, they're going to pile onto each other. The everlasting God. He's always been, he'll always be. He didn't have a beginning, he'll never have an ending. The Lord, that speaks of sovereignty. That means he's not only eternal, he's in absolute control. I'm telling you, God's in charge of who's in charge. And if you're staying up nights worrying about the election, you need to realize there's a sovereign God in charge of that too. The Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. I'm telling you, he made the cosmos, he made every black hole, every planet is held in its orbit right now by the word of the living God. Every skin cell on your body, every time your neurons fire, your heart beats or your lungs breathe. Every single thing in this universe, from snails on the ground to supernovas, God is in control of. Haven't you known? He's not tired. And there's no searching of his understanding. Look at this, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What will God do for the exhausted individual? I can't go on. I don't know where to turn. I I can't solve my difficulties. God, apparently you're not going to just change my circumstances. So what do I do? God says, I got something for you. I have something reserved for you, promised to you, stored up for you, and it is strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That word renew in Hebrew is the, uh, the Hebrew word kalaf, which means to exchange, to alter God literally says, they that wait upon me 
will exchange their strength. I'll take your weariness and give you my power. I'll take your turmoil and give you my peace. I'll take the problems going on in your heart and give you my strength in their place. God literally says, I'm going to exchange your weakness for my strength so that you can rise above like an eagle from its nest, these difficulties, this exhaustion that is plaguing you. Sounds good, doesn't it? Makes for a nice quilt, quilt, you know, thing to put on the wall. But here's where we get to it. The problem, exhaustion. We get it. The promise, strength. It's black and white, clear as can be. But now the counsel. If you were to go to the emergency room with a severe case of heat exhaustion, the doctor would do his or her best. They would have a treatment plan to get you past that exhaustion. They would have some counsel for you. Do this, take this, don't do this, rest here. God has some counsel too. The great physician has some counsel too. When you come to him exhausted, he has one word that is the key to your strength. And it is the word, wait. (sighs) Isn't that fantastic news? Don't we love waiting? Isn't that our favorite thing on planet Earth to be told, not right now. They that wait upon the Lord shall exchange their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And a lot of us can't ever read that without singing the the old song. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Because you know, Lord, I'm terrible at that. Waiting. I think here's the problem with waiting. And with this whole concept of waiting. When we think waiting, we only have in mind sitting there, doing nothing, hoping maybe it's going to get better. A waiting room, right? The whole room is designed to sit there and watch the door or watch the little digital board. And I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do. Maybe there's a good magazine, I hope, because there's not one single thing in my existence other than just watching that door, and when they come out, they'll come out. Is that what he means? God to just say, hey, I know you're exhausted. I've got nothing for you now, but don't worry. Jesus is coming back one day. Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying, hey, I I know you're beat and you can't go on, and I'm not going to help you at the moment, but but when you kind of get over this and you don't really need my help, I'm going to show up then. Y'all, that's blasphemy. How could we believe that a God that would give his son and hang him on a cross for us would do us like that. Let me give you a few thoughts on waiting this morning and I'm going to be done. The Bible definition of waiting implies a couple of things. The first one it implies is focus. Focus. There's something to do when you're exhausted. There's something to do. And listen, it's not a mountain climb. It's not doing something that you can't generate the energy for. It it looks a lot like this. Psalm 123.1. If you want to turn there, that's cool. Otherwise, I'm going to read it to you. Psalm 123.1 says it like this. Unto thee I lift up my eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, So our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until he have mercy upon us. He's using a metaphor here for somebody in a restaurant who comes to you to get you your food and their whole goal, especially if they're good, is to make sure your drink stays filled, to make sure you have the two implements you need, to make sure you're taken care of. They're called waiters, waitresses. A good one is going to make sure that you have 
their undivided attention so they can see what you need. Listen, when you're exhausted, C.S. Lewis once said, God whispers in our prosperity, He shouts in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a lost and dying world. When you're exhausted, I want to tell you one thing, friend, listen. Get your antenna up because God's wanting to talk to you. When you are exhausted, I'm telling you, sometimes God will lay you flat on your back so you'll stop running and stop working long enough to just look up. Focus. God, for this period of my life, I am going to give you increased attention. I'm going to put my spiritual antenna up. Lord, I know you have something to say. I know you have something to give. So I'm going to get my eyes on you. Psalm 27, 13. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3. Somebody needs to write this down in your Bible today. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, focused on thee because he trusts in thee. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, you know what, right now, when I'm this exhausted, that I feel like I can't go on, this book is going to become my daily meditation. I'm telling y'all, there, there are moments in my life, I've had one recently, where I had to come back to, you know what, I need a season here where the TV goes off for a while, because when I'm tired, when I'm exhausted, I don't want to run, I don't want to work, I, wa I want to veg out, I want to tune out. I want somebody else to do my thinking for me. I want to obliterate silence because it's in the silence that I get uncomfortable. That's what we talked about last week. Friend, I want to tell you something. Listen, that silence is a gift. God is after you. God is seeking you. God's got something to say to you. Give Him your undivided for some of you, that may mean that little season where you get on Facebook or Twitter and say, y'all, I'm taking a break. See you in a month. It may be that, that moment where you take some of that vacation time and you head off to the mountains. It may be that few moments where you just pause before anybody wakes up in the morning and say, oh God, I'm here. You don't have to say a whole lot. You don't have to read a whole lot. You don't have to do a whole lot. But you're saying, God, I, I'm, I'm watching. I'm listening. Focus. Here's another thing it implies. Weight implies rest. I'm not going to spend long on this because it ties in with the first thought. Try, stop trying to be brave. Stop trying to be the one who just keeps on marching. Stop trying to evade the fact that you are tired. You're exhausted. God knows it. You know it. Don't pretend. Get real. Isaiah 30, verse 15. A lot of scripture this morning because that's where the power is. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. Wait a minute. Not in conduct and fighting and working and strife. In returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And then he ends it with these tragic words. And you would not. But you said, no, we'll flee upon horses. Therefore shall you flee and we'll ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. He says you're going to try to outrun your problems and you're going to find out your, out pro your problems run quick. You know what our main problem is? Wherever we go, there we are. 
right? If I could just change my circumstances, I'd be better, right? And then you get into what you thought was better, and two months in, you're back in the same boat because the problem that went with you was you. He says, okay, you're, you're going you're gonna to run, but your problems are going to run faster. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall you flee till you be left as a beacon on the top of a mountain, as a flag on a hill. And then, oh, y'all, this melts me down. God says, therefore will the Lord wait. You won't wait on me, so I'm going to wait on you. Some of you listen to me. Oh, I love you. And I've been here. I've been there recently. Your real problem is you're not quite tired enough yet. Because you're still trying to work it out. You're still trying to manipulate people into getting what you want. You're still trying to like somehow squeeze the situation into being what you want it to be. And God is waiting till you get so flat, dog, exhausted, you can't even do that anymore. And that's the moment he's going to show up for you. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait on him. One more thought, okay? If you're tired, if you're tired, if you're exhausted, if you're stressed, if you're burdened, This is a season for you, listen, of focus on Jesus, of rest. You know what? Every morning, some of y'all know this, I have to, like a child, I have to give my journal to the Lord because my journal is all about my plans and my activities and my stuff. And Lord, this is how I want my day to go. Please bless it. Lord, here's my plan. Please get behind it. Please sponsor my agenda, God. And he's like, nah, I got my own agenda for you. So every morning, like a child, I have to say, Lord, here's my journal, and I'm giving it to you. I'm asking you to write the story of my life today. You know what that means? That means that the people that cut you off in traffic, God let them do it. That means when you go to work and it stresses you out, God's like, I'm going to use that. So I'm trying to fight it, accept it, that it's coming from the Lord, and let me write your story. Stop fighting. Rest in me. Y'all, I had one of those weeks this week where like everything I tried was just a brick wall over and over and over. I, I had just every time I'd get down to study, interruption. Every time I'd get ready to study, problem. You know, and so, so the other morning I wake up early and I didn't realize, I go in there to my little spot with my little altar, my candle that I light and the whole thing, and I get ready and I, I didn't realize Vance had slept in, right in the room on, on the night before on the couch in my spot almost. So I go in there and I'm like, I'm not going to wake him up. I, I'll have some time with the Lord. I get my coffee, I light my candle, he wakes up just in time to kick the coffee out of my hand. And he's like, Dad, you want to play a video game? Oh, honey, i got to study. We hadn't spent any time together. And then it's like the parental guilt, right? It's like, well, he's right. One thing after another. And the Lord had to bring me back this week to, you know what? I'm not in control of this. This isn't my life. This isn't my way. The problem is we want to be the director of this show and not realize we're just a bit part we, we want everybody to get in line, and lighting guy, you do this, and sound man, you do this, and all of you go here, and, and when our life doesn't go that way, we wind up exhausted, and God is saying, it's time to focus, and it's time to open up your journal and rest right now. Last thing, waiting does mean patience. Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. 
He's put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman that maketh the Lord his or her trust and respecteth not the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. You ever heard this saying, God is seldom early, but he's never late. In this fast food microwave society, we have forgotten how to wait for things. Can I just promise you something? Listen. When God's got you in the fire, His hand is on the thermostat. That period between your praying and His showing up is every bit as important as the resolution. Patience. Charles Spurgeon is one of my favorites. God kept his son waiting, and he may very well keep you in like posture. But I cannot see how I will be delivered. Wait. But I'm ready to die under this terrible load. Wait. But I've been hurt. Wait. But I've believed a promise and it hasn't been fulfilled. Wait. For you wait in blessed company. You may hear Jesus saying, I waited patiently. He teaches us to do the same by His gracious, Holy Spirit. This verse, y'all, some of you, may the Lord God seal this to your heart right now. Psalm 30 and verse 5. For His anger endures but a moment. In His favor is life. Listen. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh God, thank you that most often you don't have to change my circumstances you can change me right in the middle of them. You can give me you, and that's the best gift I could possibly have.